Welcome to Driven to Create, the podcast that explores the journeys of those who can't help but bring their ideas to life. Today's episode is all about craft and constraints. Though we speak primarily on collaborative efforts for client-facing work, there is so much that you can take away by applying some of these topics to solo ventures. I'm joined by Colin Thays, a film director and producer whose work spans across multiple genres, and he's created for networks such as Hallmark, Netflix, and NBC Universal. In this episode, he offers some insights on working with constraints and how clarity at the beginning of the production process ensures that both the crew and the client are totally aligned on the vision. Colin, if you can uh, introduce yourself for me, that would be great. And uh, yeah, give it, tell us why you're uh, popular. Thank you. Well, I'm not popular. Unsurprisingly, I am a giant nerd. Um, thank you for having me on here. Yeah, I, I'm a filmmaker. Um, I do. Uh, started off with Andrew Gernhard doing low-budget monster movies, direct to video, and have kind of worked away into doing a lot of uh, television movies and holiday movies and Hallmark movies. But I'm at heart, I'm a big film nerd, and I love working on movies. Yeah, and, and everyone loves a good ho- holiday movie. Um. <laughs> They do. You that like shockingly, they love that. Hey, everyone wants to feel good around the holidays. Um, so I'm just I'm just looking through my notes here, and uh, so today today we're talking about craft and constraints. And every project we have, whether it be a movie or whatever, we always have some sort of constraints on us. And it's finding a way to play inside that little sandbox, which is is. is it's the hardest thing, you know, for, you know, when, when those are imposed on you. Um, so starting off, if we can talk about the differences between starting fresh on a project or being brought in to when somebody else has already started something. And so whether you have to script doctor, a, you know, a, a film script, or if you're being brought on later in, you know, after pre-production's done, and this is the first look that you've had into, you know, production, you're like, oh, all right, join, join them on set. And uh, you know, get get your sea legs and, and get going. Um, can can you talk about that real quick, and then we'll delve deeper into that? Yeah, no, I think it's a really interesting question. Uh, I mean, I, first of all, I think it's really cool and interesting that you put together this podcast to kind of look at these these questions about creativity and how it works. Because I don't think there's a straightforward answer, despite all of the. Uh, you know, YouTube shorts that would have you believe there's just one secret trick. But I think that, you know, for to some extent, every creative project is a kind of cascading series of decisions that you're locking in as you go, right? There's the initial inspiration, the idea, um, the concept, then once you've chosen, you start to explore and add add new layers of creativity to it as you go. So it's like you start with a plot and then you or a concept and you come up with a plot and then characters and then as you you know all the way down to filming when you're on set like choices of you know what kind of drink would that person have and uh you know how would they sit and you you know these little things but they all add up to make the whole picture so i feel like the the creative process begins with big picture and kind of works its way down with creative choices happening all the way and when you come on to someone else's project you are joining in or on a collaborative project and film is, you know, very much a collaborative project. You're coming in at a point where some of those decisions have already been made. Um, Some of those constraints have already been locked in and you're kind of picking up and owning your part, I guess is how I would describe that. Right. Yeah. And it it almost seems like, like, and we could talk later about communication and how that, that, um, that plays into this, but it's it's almost like learning how to communicate too to get you up to speed as much as fast as possible too. So asking the right questions, it, it sounds like an easy thing, but you know, it, it it often takes years to learn what the right questions are. So you know, especially if you're starting with somebody else's vision, um, you need to know. You, you have to take a holistic pr- perspective as soon as possible so you're not reeling the whole time, you know? Um, so, I, I, you know, one, one of the big topics in this is, you know, exploration versus execution. 
So, or you could say invention, um, invention versus execution. You know, they they one generally takes more time than the other. Uh, one is less efficient <laughs> than the other. But so you know, exploration or invention is where the magic happens. Um, execution is is you already had the blueprint and you're just you're ticking things off the list as close as possible because like you know as you know like all the on a on a film set all the the creative decisions should be made ahead of time and you know there's always a little tweaking here and there but ideally you would have a solid attack plan yeah although i think that you don't you don't ever really want i mean i think it's a it's a very important topic of invention versus or creation versus ex- or whatever you want to say it yeah, versus yeah. Uh, exploration versus execution. That was good. That was how you mm-hmm. said it. Um, but I think that you never really want the exploration to stop. And I think for something to be the best it can be, you want to have some degree of exploration happening all the way through though. You have to kind of draw a limit of what you're exploring at any given point. Like it's very counterproductive if you're working on a project to get, you know, halfway through and then be like, well, what if it was about, <laughs> you know, something completely different pirates. And he's like, well, you know, it's too late for that. Like commit, commit to something. Um, right. But you may be at the point where you're, you know, hammering out the details and there's still more choices and things to be discovered in the, in the, in the work and what the, what potential lies there. Uh, but it is kind of a two different types of thought to some extent. I, I find that ex- exploration wise, the, the best ideas come when you're kind of uninhibited and unconcerned with consequences and expectation. <laughs> uh, actually, in your, in your last episode, you said something I thought was very interesting, which is you you said you wanted to do a podcast, but you hadn't done it because you had to put your, your work self into it. You had to make it matter professionally. And that was mm-hmm. holding you back from doing it. And I was like, that I, I related to that a lot um, because sometimes knowing the stakes makes you unwilling to take risks. Um, and I feel like the the best real creative stuff comes when you're doing something with no consequence. Just like, I'm going to do this because I feel like it. Um, but then you have to follow that up with execution, right? And execution is what people pay for, um, right? Like a great movie idea is, is worthless. It's a great script that's worth something or a great actual movie. And so like 98% of the process is doing it, Um as opposed to having the the idea. But you do still want to keep having ideas as you go, whether that's you working on a project by yourself or a team um, and delegating enough enough of a piece of the pie to some somebody else that they still have some creative investment and they still have choices to make of their own and they're not just literally doing the thing. Um, if you want people to be involved in the team, you have to give them some something to do. Right. Now, that's actually a... Uh a good way of putting it and I, I i probably should qualify that a little bit more where where um the broad strokes should be painted beforehand and then like there should be room like it's all about i guess it would be all about setting tolerances for for how much creativity are we going to allow and not in the sense of like we need we you know quantifying creativity because you can't do it but but st- still say all right well here's the things that we have to get done for the day here's what our shoot day looks like we're, we're doing good on time. What do you think about this line here? Do you think you should, could you add something to that? You know, would you be holding a cigar? Would you be doing, you know, like there, there maybe there's room for some of these, this emergent creativity. Um, and I, I think I, you know, I, I so identify with what you said about, you know, playing it safe when the second the guardrails are up, because you're like, oh, you know, then you start trying to be a psychic and you're you're putting yourself in your client's <laughs> shoes, or whoever that is, or your executive producer or whoever, and you're trying to think of what they're thinking, but you're not you're not doing the most of what you can be doing because you're afraid of somebody saying no to you. Or even if you're doing it just for yourself, that you have to make something that you think lives up to your own standards, you Mm. know, professionally, um, that can be a barrier to not attempt something, especially if it's something you're less experienced with. Um, But that's probably bad if you're trying to actually be creative. (laughs) 
Yeah, yeah, and and it's so funny how like you know like this podcast is totally a, an exploration in my own creativity because you know I I don't know how big of a market there is I don't know how many people want to think deeply on these topics you know it it is easier to look for that single uh, you know that panacea like that one trick to fix your you know, creative problems, and it it doesn't exist. And it comes down to, you know, one of the the video topics. Uh, you know, I'll be doing at a later point is uh, fundamentals when fights, and it's so funny how having good fundamentals set you you up for success in a way that like everyone wants that one trick. And, you know, push that one button to fix something, but oftentimes, you know, like if if you're if you're shooting a video or shooting a film, you know, it's all the fundamentals. Is it is it good lighting? Is it good audio? Is it a good story? You know, do, can people understand it? And it's 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 those that typically set you up for success. Um, but you know, with with the whole issue of constraints and everything, um, you know, sometimes they could be they could be uh, Inhibitive, if that's a word, inhibitive, prohibitive. Um, but oftentimes, you can find creativity within mild constraints. So, like if you have clear, a clear box that you're living in, and you you know where all the edges are and the sides of that box, you can figure out how to play inside that box. When there, you know, like if you can get a, and I, I think oftentimes, you know, we have constraints, but they're not always clear. You know, um, like our clients or whoever, or even ourselves, we're not entirely sure where the box ends. We just say, we don't want this. We don't want that. But then, you know, you don't know (laughs) what realm you're really playing in. Because if you know, like, we don't need this, we don't need this, we don't need this, and we should be feeling this. You're like, oh, okay, I can I can go off of the positive, which is we should be feeling something. And I know what not to do. So we get rid of the negatives Um, and you can kind of play within there because they're like, oh, okay, they just want these things. And, and I, I think one of the other things is, is finding, finding out whether if it's within ourselves or if it's within our clients is firing out, finding out the true motivation, why something doesn't feel good. Because oftentimes people think that something is bad or wrong, but they don't they know that something feels wrong, but they might not necessarily know what is actually wrong. So like, you know, if, if you, you know, like I'm sure you've, you've run into this often. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think that, um, there's, the, there's a few points in there that I think are, are, are good. Um, one is about limits sometimes being beneficial, um, which I think is true that if you have a totally unbounded, task, you can come up with anything you want. And it's very unlikely that you're going to be doing the same thing as everyone else involved if it's a creative collaboration. Um, but also, you know, it can give you a sense of where to start thinking. Uh, you know, sometimes the assignment itself, the fact that to use a movie example, you or, I, you know, I've heard this used as an example in architecture. If everybody involved knows that you are building a single family house on this hill with the south is that way, you have a starting point, whereas if you're just like, here's a grid, build a house, you know, it's like, where do you begin? Um, so on a a creative project like a movie, you know, one of the challenges is a kind of everyone down the chain of command becomes the client for the person uh, below them to some extent. And it's about communicating what you need done in a way that is enabling and not restrictive. So I, I sometimes think of the the job of directing as being the, the person who makes sure everyone on the team is working on the same movie. Uh, that I just did a, a thriller, for instance, and, you know, I was trying to think as I started up, like, what can I tell people? Because we're all read the same script. We all know what this movie's about. Um, and it was a pretty good script. So, like, I didn't, didn't need, like, horrendous clarification. Uh, But what it did need was a sense of the tone. Like, what is the tone? What is the style? What is the feeling that we're going for? And trying to explain the function of each thing that was being done to, you know, the various departments to make sure that we're all working towards the same goal. Uh, You know, like in, there's a, 
you know, a sequence that happens at night in the dark where very specific pieces of information need to be conveyed, but others definitely don't. And so talking to the different departments about picking a location that enabled us to do that, about um, leaving silence in the music to make sure we can hear things we need to hear and about picking props and costumes that hide things and casting people who look similar enough that you might be confused about identities. And, you know, there's a whole lot of choices that need to come together to make the same feeling. And you can tell when it's wrong. Um, I don't want to name names, but I just watched a horror movie the other day and it was like pretty good. Um, it was felt like a serious kind of horror movie, but then the, the like ghost people came out and they looked like they were right out of a, you know, Halloween haunted hayride. And I was like, well, that doesn't match. Um, <laughs> you, know, like you guys right. didn't talk about like what tone this movie has. Um, and now it's just confusing. I don't know. Yeah, if that, that's two different points, but no, no, no. But that that's an interesting. The the first point you made, it, it's interesting because oftentimes we want to be dic- like if we're if we're doing work for for clients, if we're creating for clients, and we have these constraints, we oftentimes expect that they communicate exactly what. You're you're hoping that they know what they need, and you're hoping that they can communicate it clearly. And over over the years, I, I found that you know, I I can't put that on them for them to communicate because if if you only know what you know, and if they don't know exactly, you know, they you have to assume that if you're an expert in your field, your client may not be have the same level of technical proficiency as you um so you, you'll inherently communicate differently and and it's it's on you to to translate that almost so like i've i've almost taken a step back where if somebody says hey i need xyz uh hey i need a video well you know i'll break it break it down into it's 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 the some some parts where it's uh the sum of its parts or whatever it's parts um where I'll be like, why do you need a video? Well, blah 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 blah. Well, how how should you how should the the viewer feel when they're watching? And like, oftentimes you'll get a knee jerk reaction back, like it's a waste of their time. But you know, once they start playing ball, you you start digging into like why like why do they want this and what are they hoping to achieve with it? Which are like always two of the biggest things with with a movie. A similar thing if if you can't nail down the tone then everyone's making you know like they're making it in their own vision but everyone's got different tastes so some people might like in in your case if there's a thriller like some people might think of a lifetime thriller or some other people might think of you know like a blockbuster movie two totally different tones you know one one may be tongue in cheek or you know you could laugh at it and the other one might try to take itself seriously and I think that's that's where a lot of people get communication wrong is and my I myself have been a victim of this is you expect people to communicate your way, but you almost have to help people learn how to talk to you. So even if it's annoying, and I have no problem today being annoying, but it took me <laughs> years to you know to ask these questions and it's, uh, you know and at some point or earlier in my career it's like you know you want to look like you're the best in the business you want to you want to seem like the smartest one in the room and now i just want to get to the right answer so it's like okay you need a video what are we trying to achieve for one who is our target audience too and how do we communicate this to everyone working so we're all making the same same movie or same video um, yeah, or whatever creative project it is. I mean, I think you're right to start off and say, like, why are we doing this and what is the the intent? Um, and it, there may not be an answer, right? Like, the answer well, may the be problem. to make money, um, which is... But, like, learning that there is no answer is an answer. And, it you know, that's an opening. That's a space to work in. But you do need to know what... Like, I, there, I know we're going to talk about it later, but one of the you know, the dreaded words in, in the film world is notes. And I think in any creative world with clients is is notes is a, a good or bad. It is a painful to receive, important to give, can be productive, can be very difficult to handle and or very counterproductive. Um, but learning how to give good notes is related to knowing what the point is and being and about communicating uh, what the what the goals and intent and needs are. 
uh, that you're trying to achieve and making sure that you're both trying to do the same thing. Yeah. And I, you know, it's, it's funny. I think honesty and good communication go, go hand in hand, especially when giving notes. Cause I find some people are just inherently really good at giving notes. They're focused on the end goal. They're like, here's what I see that could be improved. A, B, C, and D. Great. Those are awesome notes. Y- you know, the person executing the notes will probably thank the, you know, the higher up for giving them, even if they're a pain in the, the butt to do. But, um, the other, the, the other form of notes, no red, nobody looking left, no high angles. <laughs> I, that's, that's, a, that's a different one, but that's actually a good one too. Um, the one that I was thinking of is, is inserting ego into the notes. So personal taste, things like that. Um, it's not being true to what the, the, the end goal is. It's, it's injecting your f- fingerprint on, on something. And that is not helpful because it confuses everyone working under you. Um, um, and, you know, it just muddies the process because you may get a worse result because we all know that, like, great things come from collaborative efforts. And if, if you're just like, do this because, you know, maybe this, this, you know, this guy should be shirtless in it. And it's like, well, how does that move the story along? You know, like, and, that, and that's happened to us in, in the past um, where it's like this, this may not be appropriate. Um, or like, uh, what if this guy's holding a whatever, you know, it's like, well, what's the purpose of that? It, you know, it, it's just a personal taste thing and it's all ego driven. It's just, you want to leave a, a fingerprint. That's ineffective note giving. And then that's an effective management in general, right? I mean, it's which is related. I mean, uh, you know, uh, in in any collaborative endeavor, personality management and dealing with people is going to be a huge part of it. Uh, and it's extremely difficult to disentangle uh, the end result from from the process, uh, unfortunately, uh, <laughs> while right. still having positive relationships with people around. Like, I feel like the the best relationships, if you can manage to achieve them are ones where you're not afraid to try things, not afraid to tell people when those things they try don't work, um, and not not making choices that make people happy, but making choices that make the work the best. Um, I mean, you know, to the extent that not you're not being inconsiderate or just a complete jerk, but, like, I know sometimes you get things where a lot of work has gone into something and you see it and it doesn't work. And, you know, maybe it works well enough that you let it go. But I think in an ideal world, you don't, right? You you scrap it or you change it. Um, and that you just have to be kind of calculating on what the best result is for everybody. Uh, and this is a definitely a case of do as I say, not as I do. But um, that, <laughs> that, that relationship is is important because you're dealing with people who all, if you've done it right, have a creative investment in, in what they're doing. Um, and you know, being on the receiving end of, of this, the scrap it is, can be frustrating. Um, especially if you don't understand why. Exactly. And that's where, where I, I get to with communication too, because it's like the, the third point that you had made, if, if somebody gives bad notes in the form of they're vague or they're not clear, where it's like, don't look left or don't do this or this, blah, 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 blah. I think the onus is on the, the creator or the person doing the creative work to push back. And it shouldn't be seen as a, a, a form of like bad behavior, but to say, can, right. can you elaborate on this? How would you define this? I, and oftentimes I've asked people, please define what this word means. And I sound like an idiot when I'm asking, uh, you know, like a client or somebody else like that. I don't even care because it's like, let's, let's define this word, set the guardrails around the word. So I know what to expect or what you're expecting to see. And I think, I think that like with communication, the way I've been uh, looking at it is it's almost like you're dating again. It's a new, it's a new relationship. You know, if somebody ghosts you, in a relationship, like on uh, whatever the kids use these days, uh, t- Tinder or whatever. Um, if somebody ghosts you, that's not a good sign for the relationship. If somebody tries to exert power over you, that's never a good sign for an honest relationship. Like uh, a good relationship should try to experiment and, and figure out what it, what each each person likes 
and and figure out how to grow together. Like these are all signs of a good relationship. So why wouldn't we apply these to our uh, you know our engagements with work or with our creative works? But we have like oftentimes you know we don't really either a have a choice where there it, this is you want the job or not you know, or B, you're too afraid to push back because you might want another job from them. So it's it's like, I, I think the the most important thing is getting a clear picture where everyone's at. And if there's trust involved, where it's like, okay, Colin's at the top of his game. He's done all this work over the period of whatever, 16 years or 15 years, 17 years. I don't know. We're, we're right <laughs> there together. It's too many. <laughs> There should be, you know, we've worked with him in the past. He's he's bright. He has some good ideas. He's kind of a nerd. Maybe we can explore this sci-fi angle. Show us what you can come up with. And like, uh, you know, within this realm that would appeal to this demographic, can you do that? And you're like, yeah, sure. I'll have a treatment of, you know, I'll have uh, five different uh, topics for you. you. You could collect. But, you know, having the trust for you to be able to go and play and not saying, you know, if you look at that from uh, converse, conversely, if you look at that like it like it is in film where it's a buyer's market and they're like, yeah, show us uh, 20 topics and we'll select what we like. And then, you know, like so it, and that does happen. And oftentimes, you know, filmmakers or other creatives, you're kind of at the mercy of where the money's at or who's willing to spend the money. 100 uh, percent. And, you know, what I was saying before is definitely ideal. I mean, there's the real world is often less straightforward than that. And like in talk in terms of pushing back on notes, it's almost like a, there's a capital expenditure in doing that. And it's like I will sometimes push back on notes like in, in edit or in script stage. But you kind of have you can only do so many. So if you get 60 notes, I'll, you know, I'll calculate like, OK, I can do three things that I, that I really don't think. Um, you know, and some of them it may be like, you know, I, I really feel strongly about you, you, you know, you might show that you tried, but explain why you couldn't do it. And sometimes you might make an argument back and like, here's what you asked for, but here's why I think it's wrong. But you have to be careful of, you know, the, of the relationship aspect of it, um, which is why when I work with actors, one of the I upfront like to tell people and they rarely actually take me up on it. Um, but I say, like, please tell me when you disagree with me. Uh, I want to know uh, because I, I just want the best result. I don't want it to be my best result. Uh, and I, because I, I, I think that that willingness to try things is important, especially, you know, it's, we're talking a lot about the, the film creation side, but on the performance side, you know, you, you see that when you see an actor in a movie who comes out and does, has like a real weird character quirk or something like mm -hmm. you got to be willing to try that and not feel that you're going to get stuck with it if it doesn't work. And you have to trust that if it's dumb, the director's going to tell you, no, that's dumb. Uh, please don't do that. That does, does not look good. Because <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, if you're not willing to try, you'd never get there. And I remember uh, Josh Kelly was like, one time we were just sitting there and he goes, you know, I was thinking, how would Nicolas Cage read this line? And he's like, and... Uh, <laughs> You know, his reading would be super weird. And he's like, and that's awesome. Like, it's really cool that he got to a point where he can do these bizarre takes on characters. And you have to be willing to try that stuff to find that voice, um, to not just do it the, the safe way. Um, and of course, you know, in terms of timing, often that is the enemy of, of that kind of experimentation where it's like, you know, like I said, with expending capital to push back on notes, it's like you really, if you're doing 10 pages a day, you can only do so many experimental takes because you just won't have the time. So um, you have to weigh those choices carefully in, right. in the real world. And anyone making creative things encounters this, and and yeah. like uh, communication and trust are always one of the biggest <laughs> problems. And it's it's it you know sometimes you can never build it up. You know, like either either people will have a certain image of you from. Uh, you know, from an earlier point or that some people want to have control and that's fine. There's plenty of people that, that are willing to just do the job and go home. But I think if, if, you know, the mo most important thing is the, the end goal, like the product, um, I think above all communication and trust are paramount. 
because otherwise otherwise you're never going to get your full potential out of it and it's again it is idealistic i know it never happens i know ego is involved i know you know especially with with film where sometimes it feels like you're hurting cats you know <laughs> it just well, the more people you have involved in a, in a project the more <laughs> the personality management and side of it is going to matter <laughs> Right, that's a nice way of putting it. Personality management. Yeah, <laughs> I, I prefer herding cats, but um, you know, and and like everyone's everyone's got their own point of view, and especially with film too, where everyone's a specialist, so they're good at their jobs. Like, they're, you just have to assume that they have some level of proficiency in what they're doing. You would hope. Um, so they're gonna have a point of view, you know. Yeah, and I th- that's why I said I feel like communicating intent is the. Is the is the key because I mean, and that applies to virtually every, you know, every every position and every aspect, no matter how small you think it is. Um, that if you've explained, you know, what you're trying to get a, to get across, there's a, a bunch of different ways to come at it, and you want to pick the way that the person you're working with is actually best able to execute. So, you know, one of the things I often say when I've been brought in to do a, a rewrite or to give notes on something that I'm going to direct is is that it's not just that we have to find a, a story that works. It's that we have to find a story that works that I understand why it mm-hmm. works. Because if it works in a way that doesn't make sense to me, I'm not going to pull it off. Um, right. Yeah. And there, uh, you know, I, one one example of that is I remember when Animal came our way I initially read it and was like, I don't want to do this movie. I, I think it's not a good script. And then I saw the movie uh, and it was, came out really, really well. And I was like, oh, like they shot it as if it's like a, a teen horror movie. Like it's kind of for kids. And like that was the answer. Like that totally worked. It absolutely worked. Never thought of it. So it's like it's not just that you need to tell somebody what – you know, uh, the reason you communicate intent to somebody isn't just to be efficient, but because you have to let them find a solution that they can execute. Um, and so if I say I need this, I need to make an office that makes this person feel intimidating and wealthy, you know, uh, you let the production designer find the solution to that. Don't tell them I want pictures of boats. Like, if you say that, you might get cute little kids drawings of boats. I, you know, like <laughs> this, 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 you need to try to get to the point, I guess, and leave the rest to other people to to do their way. I think that's the important part too. Is that you know the more uh, proficient folks that are giving their input, they also have uh, like expanded horizons that you may not have. So they might see things. You know, so it's it it. You know, as a as a film director, it's important for you to communicate the vision so that everyone can know exactly where you stand, and then they can do their creative. So it's like all these branches of a tree, you know, and, and you're kind of the the trunk, dare I say, um, where everything's branching off because you're you're really directing traffic, and everyone's going off from there, and you're just making sure this tree stays pruned. Well, to go back to what the thing you said at the beginning, right? It's it's about locking in constraints as you go, um, and you know, in in a scene, sometimes there there may, may be great ideas as you're shooting it, but you know, this is a scene about a guy on a bench peeling a banana. Why? Well, too late. Like it is that. That is what this scene is. <laughs> now let's make it the best version of that that we can as a group. Um, uh, you don't want to get there and completely reinvent what you're doing because it f- presumably fits into a bigger puzzle. Um, but you, you know, it, it each, each, each department locks their choices in as you go. And each, each choice also contributes to the, to the, to the feeling uh, with another example being a, a rack focus. Like oftentimes you don't initially communicate on a, on a first take when to do a rack. You might say that it needs to happen. Sometimes you don't even say it somebody just does it. Right. But like when that rack happens, changes the feeling of the of the scene and if you're you know you want your ac to understand the story and the scene and the feeling and the tone so that they just naturally make the right choice to contribute towards that that goal but sometimes you see it you say actually rack a second later because i want it to feel more like an afterthought than like us telling the audience something before uh the characters know you know like the the timing matters 
Right. Yeah. Especially, uh, especially like cues on humor too, you know, and it just oh, an yeah. abrupt rack. But uh, so, so for people that don't know what a rack focus is, it's when you go from one subject uh, to another with the focus. So you shift the focus from maybe a foreground to a, a mid ground subject. Um, and AC is a assistant camera person um, who changes yes. the focus. Um, I don't feel acronyms. like right. <laughs> I, I wrote two, my show notes were too long last time, so I just, uh, I'm, I'm keeping them, keep them in the uh, video. Um, but no, like, yeah, 100%. And it's like, once You're people have part out, <laughs> what I like it. No, I, I really like it. Um, well, we're going to have to cut this out because now it's awkward. I'm just Especially kidding. I'm going to leave it in. Yeah, I know. We're going to leave it in. I want this as awkward as possible. Um, so, I mean, the, so, t- so tell me about the challenges of, of rewriting somebody else's script because that, that must be really difficult to like try to picture the vision that somebody had but still adhere to whatever, whatever the grand goal is and whatever this script may have missed. Yeah, I mean, for me, the, the, the best rewrite assignments are when you're shooting something, the script is already good, and you're just polishing it to the to the best its be- fullest potential and adjusting it to match what you're actually going to shoot um i have uh to talk about john doolin uh stalker's prey 2 uh, i really liked his script and we were going to shoot it and i added like one scene at the end and tweaked some lines of dialogue but really it was just like you know i feel like when you're personally like the ideal version of this is like when you're personally really close to something um you don't You've you've narrowed yourself down, locked in all these choices into where you're at, and you want somebody else to see it who sees what you're trying to do, uh, and then has some kind of out of out of the box contributions to to take it up another notch. But more often than not, when you're asked to to approach something like that, it's more like we don't think this is working for these reasons. Uh, please fix it. Um, and so often uh, when you're assigned a rewrite task, it comes with requests and constraints and targets. And you have to know also the requests and constraints and targets that were previously dealt with and or for the, for the, like for the market that that script is for. Like you're not just making the script the best version of what it can be. You're making it the best version of what it can be for this network or this audience or this, you know, whatever its target is. And then you have to read it, see which choices are are already made. Um, what is the story about? It like really better be decided already. <laughs> really stinks when that's up for debate. Um, and then try to find what's already there and strengthen it, uh, which may mean combining some characters or pulling some pieces out or reworking some dialogue or, or whatever. But you're it's a it's a different stage. It's not like I have a cool idea for a movie about whatever. It's like how can I make this movie the best version of what it's trying to be um, already? Uh, and it's a it's a different kind of creativity than the exploration stage. You're not free associating ideas and coming up with something neat and cool. You're working on a problem. It's the execution stage with less of the you know more decisions already locked in Uh, so you have to read it and understand it and see what's already been done and why i guess right so i guess i guess uh that's kind of like script doctoring but like so let's say you have a page one rewrite do you preserve like how do you preserve some of the better elements from the previous script or you just scrap everything how do you how do you do that usually I mean, I really hate doing a page one rewrite uh, because I, you know, hopefully if you're if you're at the point of rewriting a script, there's something there that's that's good that you want to keep. Um, so I try to think of like, well, what's a version of this story that will achieve the goals that have been requested from this rewrite um, while preserving the good ideas and good choices that have already been made here. Um you know, you are fundamentally telling a story about whatever the script is about. So that's a decision that's already been made. Usually there's already a, you know, a location, some characters. Um, you may be changing the whole plot, but I like to, you know, I, I like to try to view it as like you're rearranging the puzzle pieces. 
Um, even if you're doing a complete rewrite of a script, it's like you've got these characters to work with. There's a choice. Those those are in place. So you know you you start from there and try to come up with a new plot that weaves those existing elements together. Um, because you know so much work has already gone into them, and they already work. Uh, you hope. <laughs> if they mm-hmm. don't, then right. it's a different conversation. But you know, and you may realize as you do that, like, okay, I see now that this one needs to change to facilitate these other these other emergent choices. But I always try to work from the from the point of view of keep as much of it as you can because you know it's already been it's already been done. It's already been done well enough that it got to this stage. So you, know, you don't want to reinvent things mm-hmm. just for the sake of reinventing them. But not done well enough where you wouldn't have to rewrite it from scratch. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, there's also, you know, it's not just a matter of whether it's done well. It's whether it's done well for the objective, right? And that's often the case is you get a script that's like, it's it's maybe it's it's a good script, but it doesn't make the the production happy. It doesn't achieve the goal that they set out to achieve, whether that's because they were doing different things, whether that's because those goals have changed, or whether it's because... They weren't communicated well to the writer. Um, there's a, any number of reasons it could be, but you've arrived at a point where, you know, production and script have missed their targets for each other. Right. Yeah, and it, it, it you know, and again, that goes that goes right back to communication on on the writer's part. You know, uh, the it's it's always it's always important to. You know, if if you have these scra- uh, constraints, these constraints, these constraints imposed upon you, you know, the writer needs to figure out are is what they're thinking totally in line with who's imposing the constraints. Like, what's their vision? Um, because often, oftentimes, like you can get creatives that that you know who will go with the flow and and do whatever needs to be done. But you know, there's also creatives who are cowboys. Or cowgirls, you know, and they'll go off on their own because their vision means more than the objective uh, for the production. And I, th- I think oftentimes it's difficult for for executive producers or producers to rein that in when it's already when it's already going. But on the uh, on the flip side, you know, sitting in the writer's seat, it is confusing and stressful when you don't have a clear picture of what people want. And they just tell you what they don't like, but they don't give you the, yes. the a wide depth of like, well, here's why we don't like it. Here's how we feel when we read it. Here's what we think. This character's not strong enough. This one is too cookie cutter. This doesn't fit, fit the demographic of our audience. Like, y- you need to have those like deep conversations that nobody ever wants to have, but it it, it just goes down to like communicating simply and and going back to the fundamentals of like why you're doing this and you know unfortunately oftentimes it falls on the creative like the writer to pull those answers from the person who is probably kicking and screaming if they even actually know the answers and that's and that's the thing it's like you know i find as a creative sometimes we have to be uh uh almost like a, a psychiatrist or a psychologist you know to try to to try to pull some of these like base human like these base human traits out of people and be like oh well they're saying this because they're motivated by this but you know it's almost again it goes back to trying to be psychic which is inefficient and is often wrong where if you have these 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 deeper conversations on like with 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 your client or your your executive producer executive producer of like um, or the network or whatever of why do you want to make this? What is the goal we're trying to achieve? Who are we talking to? Like even those three things, having an hour long conversation about just those three subjects without getting into the weeds of who the characters are or of, of the plot or anything like you could probably eliminate 99% of uncertainty because you'll figure it out together if they don't know already. You know, if they don't know those answers, you'll figure it out. The kind of realistic set of constraints you get is going to be like, we want to make something that feels like this for this audience. Um, and then a laundry list of things that they don't want, right? Like we don't do this kind of character. We don't do this kind of scene. We don't want sad things. We don't want people drinking wine. We don't want beach scenes. We don't want, you know, it's like you have to thread all the needle through all those hoops um, to find something that works. 
And the, the, the tension often is somewhere between can you just do the thing um, and can you find uh, a creative angle that that lets you own it and lets you do something that you think is interesting. And like as a uh, as a filmmaker, like one of the tempting choices early on, one that you see people make uh, is to say, like, I know how to do this better. Um, I can make a better movie than what this wants to be. Uh, and that's very dangerous because if people do that and they change the fundamental type of thing you're making, like it's not going to satisfy the audience who is expecting a thing. Um, and kind of one of the examples I use is like when you're talking about doing TV movies and people are like how, you know, all, every rom-com is so similar. How can you do that? And it's like, well, you have to find a, a new angle in the same the same world. You need to find a new take on this, not a new take, but a new something different, something unique to this story that makes this one worth doing. Otherwise, it's, it's just just execution. But on the other hand, if you were, say you're watching CSI and you watch the first 11 episodes of the season and then the 12th one is totally different, you're <laughs> going to be mad. Like, you're not going to be like, oh, wow, that was a really good, like, French New Wave episode. Like, you no, know, you know, <laughs> like, it doesn't matter that the person who made that episode prefers that kind of movie. That's not the kind of thing you're making. So you need to make something that um, that achieves that big picture, weaves and avoids all the the no's, and also finds its own reason to exist, I guess. Right, and I mean, it, you know, it, I guess, I guess there is some some beauty in in you know, and like, granted, it's not for everybody, but if there is some some beauty in having a strict format, and then you weaving the needle through, like, okay, no beach scenes, no this, no that, no that, and you're like, okay, what are we left with, and like, what can we do to come up with a unique take on it that nobody else has done, and like, often, I I think. I think so creatives always want to put their fingerprint on something and they want to make meaningful impact but I also think sometimes we're lazy and what comes to us easy and some you know like if we have a concept in mind or we have like this this plot that what we can think of that might have just came to us but we cling on to it because it was so easy to get to and then the hard part comes in fleshing everything out but we already set our own constraints with like we, we, we got addicted to the vision that we have, but, you know, sometimes it's hard to get a creative off of what their first instinct was, um, where oftentimes, like, again, maybe this instinct, this first instinct isn't appropriate for this audience. It's not saying it's a, it's not a great idea. It just might not work for this, but this is our format. Here's how, like, here's what we're not looking for. Here's how the flow of each of these movies should be, because, you know, a lot of these rom-coms have similar flows. Well, it's a, it becomes a question of of genre at some point, right? Like genre is, it's a set of shorthands and a set of tools that you can use to to get to things more efficiently. Like in a, in the cinematic world, uh, you know, a movie ultimately, unless it's one of, that's a new trend to be really, really long, but they're generally not that long. So if you want to have an interesting character that needs explanation, you need to take that time from somewhere else. So to do that, mm. you can use some shorthands and some characters who are uh, a little more familiar, a little more, you know, drawing on some elements that the audience already understands. Um, and whether that's setting, it's character, it's plot, like understand your genre and understand which elements you can change, which elements you can't change to still kind of fit that genre. And you, know, you can mess with the formula and change something that normally wouldn't be changed, but usually that means you have to balance it with something else that you've tightened up because the movie doesn't change its length. Um, and so, you know, th those expectations and understandings are something that's, it's kind of a back and forth between the audience and, and, and the, the storyteller and, and that it's their tools to work with. And they're also crutches you can lean on too hard at times. Um, but also in what you were saying about, uh, committing to a choice like it's it's cliche but kill your darlings and reinvent and writing is rewriting are all things people say because they're true um, and that identifying when something needs to go can be very hard and that is the kind of thing sometimes that that notes can be good for um, where you know I'll, I'll sometimes give a note on a script and I'll be like hey maybe you know this interaction here is an opportunity to build this subplot and the answer will be like well no because this story is about destiny. And I'm like, but, but why? <laughs> like, have, 
have you considered that maybe it's actually about this? Like, uh, yeah. only this little tweak opens a new depth into that into that subplot that isn't there right now. But you've basically set it up just because you were stuck in in your thought process and like this is what, it, what I'm heading towards. You didn't realize that you actually created this this more complex opportunity. Yeah, and then, and yeah, thanks for saying darlings, by the way, rather than the alternative that, that I'm triggered <laughs> by now. Um, but uh, it, you know, it's 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 funny, it kind of like what you were saying. Thanks for slamming your desk. Oh, um, sorry, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, you know, it, it's it's I did funny. Say I like, wasn't gonna do that. If, if you're trying to make it, yeah, if you're trying to make a strawberry banana shake. Uh, you know, for somebody, they're expecting, and you tell them you're making them a strawberry banana shake, they're expecting a strawberry banana shake. That doesn't mean you just have to use strawberries and bananas. You, you might be able to use a little vanilla extract. You can put a little sugar in there. You could do a little thing. But the end needs to resemble the expectation. Yeah, if you show up with an avocado kale smoothie and you're like, this <laughs> is better, um, you might think that, but they might not think that. And they're probably going to be mad. Even if they do think it's better, they ordered a strawberry banana shake. Yeah. No, it's it's 100%. And I see it happen all the time. All and the it's, time. And, and I've done and it. it. I think we all have. Yeah. But it, And I happen to like kale avocado shakes, too. <laughs> but, like, sometimes it's not my, you know, like. Yeah, it's, it's not, not what you ordered. It's not, it's not it. Um so yeah, I mean, uh, so jumping into like the stepwise nature of creation, meaning that we, you know, the typical creative process is you, you tend to start broadly and then narrow in and and fill in the gaps of, um, you know, of all those little those little nuggets and everything. Um, how is it difficult when that creative process and the stages of the creative process are dictated to you? In, in terms of time and in terms of method. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. I mean, re- realistically speaking, most projects come with deadlines and milestones and check-ins, and they don't always align with what's either best for the project or best for the process of the project. And it's just kind of a reality you have to deal with, though it can be quite annoying. And certainly in you know my world, often the schedule is a huge limiting factor. Though at the same time, it can also realistically be what makes the thing happen. That uh, I have an awful lot of projects of my own that have not happened because I, I can always work on it tomorrow. But when somebody says like, okay, we need this done by like Thursday, like, my God, you're going to get it done. Um, <laughs> and so, and uh, you know, that's kind of in some ways the the first step of of producing uh, is deciding that it it's going to happen, um, and then not taking no for an answer. Uh, and somebody somebody's got to be the one who did that. Yeah, yeah, and I think I think that's that's a big thing for creatives is to set you know um, set boundaries for things. Um, yeah, and boundaries and and milestones and. I mean, those deadlines and milestones are important for communication too. um, Even if sometimes they're 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 frustrating. Like I remember the the first time I had a a actual prop show and tell. I was so excited. Um, For those who don't know, in pre production on a movie, you have what's called a prop show and tell, which is like before you shoot, the props department comes in and meets with the director and producers and whoever and shows like these are the props and you might have choices sometimes, but either way you get to see them, um, which can be annoying for the prop department because it means they have to get all of those things before the movie even starts, which means it feels sometimes like they have to do things before they're needed. But on the other hand, from the other side, it can be hugely important a because it gives you time to correct if something's wrong, but also it gives you time to, to plan appropriately. Like sometimes you think, you know, how the scene's going to go. And then you see the actual prop and you're like, oh, that works, but it's different than I thought it was going to be in my mind. So like the the plan for that scene should change because that's not, it's not the right, it's not the same feeling um, yeah, <laughs> at all. <laughs> I think of a yeah. good example at the moment, but. No, know. that was good. It almost seemed like you were breaking the fourth wall for a second too. The fourth wall? Yeah. It's, it sounded like you were talking to the audience. I kind of, I, I kind of liked it. It was oh. very De- Deadpool, uh, She-Hulk-esque. Mm-hmm. Um, so, <laughs> I'm just kidding. 
I'm screwing with you. Um, okay, so let's see. I, I, I think I think that at, you know I think we covered a lot of stuff, and especially it, it's just so funny how everything's just hovering around communication and and collective vision, you know, and it's it. it, it it's been like the bane of my existence my whole career and I think all of ours where it's like we're just trying to figure out how to do our best work but oftentimes it comes down to managing others person personalities and not managing but necessarily like 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 learning how to speak to people to get the best out of them and making sure that everyone is completely on the same page because you know, I, I think if there's anything left out of conversations, especially when it comes to movies, like you're left with people's interpretations of what they think you mean. And often often that that is so far off the mark where it's like if we if we just sat and, and you know, established everything at the ground, you know, I, that's why pre-production is is so important. And uh, sometimes you don't have a big time frame for pre-pro. You know, you're, you're right. like, oh, it all happens oh, we in parallel. Two weeks. Yeah. Something exactly. I think that people don't realize is like, you know, a typical project we do, if we're lucky, you get three weeks of pre-production. So you start off with a pile of papers and then three weeks later, you're rolling a camera. So it's like you have to find all your locations, all your cast, all your props, all your art, all your costumes all have to come together in parallel towards a common objective. And I think what you're saying about communication is 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 true for film, but there are of course other kinds of stuff that I suspect you'll probably explore in another episode if you're doing work on your own, right? Like if you're just a painter or if I just sit down and make something with, uh, you know, writing often is a more solitary task if it's spec writing um, and not rewriting. Mm -hmm. uh, different kinds of problems and different um, creative challenges because it isn't collaborative. But for anything collaborative, theater, film, architecture, like there's a lot of stuff, right? Where you're dealing with a big group, uh, that creative, that communication is a big, a big part of it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that's why a lot of editors just like being left in their caves because they, they hate being collaborative. They're like, just give me the notes and leave me alone. Well, um, also it's important to let people do their, do their, do their work before it's reviewed. Cause I know it can be frustrating when you're yeah, editing yeah is like, I want to see if this works. And then like, as I test it out, if there's somebody in the room, they're like, no, that's no good. And I'm like, yeah, I know. I haven't like, I haven't yeah. tried the options yet. This is just one option. Um, so you need to leave people space to do their part before you look at it. <laughs> um, right. Boundaries. Uh, Boundaries, stop, yes. Stop looking at the screen. I'm not done yet. I, I can't tell you how many times I've said that in, in those words my entire career. It's like, stop looking at the screen. I'm not done yet. You know, you have to have that room, uh, you know, exploration. You have to have that room to explore, even if it's on a small scale. And you're like, all right, let me explore for like an hour. Let me let me audition these five different camera angles to see what works the best for this scene. But if somebody's sitting over your shoulder, breathing on your neck, saying, Oh, no, 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 no. You know, it's like, yeah, go away. Um, and on that front, if you're talking about what you said about um, challenges of, of milestones and plans that are set, one of the things I one of the places I feel like often we leave the most on the table in a, in a movie that I work on is the edit where you're you rap and then your director's cut is due sometimes very quickly. Like I've had. 24 hours or two days to do a director's cut and then you hand that in and it's not like they then say okay now go back and work on it more it's like then you start getting specific changes which means you've locked in all these choices and it's like there's just not enough time to watch everything not to mention like actually review each piece so you lock those choices in very quickly um, when you request to be in the process too quickly um and I feel like that can often be to the detriment of of the result. And that applies to every stage, right? You have to let people do their thing before you look at it. But uh, but yeah, like I when I edit, like I I like to take apart a scene and check each each piece. If it doesn't feel quite right, I'll play with the cut, try the other takes, try a different timing, try a different cutting order. Sometimes I go back to the way it was, but like you 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 want to see, you want to test. And if you don't have time to experiment like that. Like you'll you'll get a functional cut, but it probably isn't going to be the best one it could be, because you haven't tried all the 
all the reasonable approaches. Yeah, no, I, I actually have a buddy uh, out in Chicago who owns an agency, and he's always saying, he's always like, good ideas need time to sleep on or something. To, I'm paraphrasing, but he's like, you need to sleep on sleep on it. You know, give, give things room to breathe. You take a look at it with a semi-objective eye. And then you know, just tweak and uh, let let ideas mature. So any editing decisions you might make, because yeah, like like you said, once you go through the director's cut and things are locked in, you know, like you can't walk that scene back and and be like, oh yeah, I just happened to change this later on, and you're like, they weren't expecting to see that change, unless yeah. unless you 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 set them up saying, I'm really not happy with the scene. I think if we give it a second look. Give me a few days on it, blah, 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 blah. Um, but that that just goes back to managing expectations. Right. And there's, you know, sometimes you can and sometimes you can make additional changes, but any, once you've gotten a specific note on a thing, usually it's kind of set then. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it's like if you if I if I draw a picture of a flower and you're like the petals should be pink, it's gonna stay a flower. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. Like, yeah. <laughs> in fact, the next draft's not gonna be you know, a race car. Uh, so it's, you, you're lock, you're locking in decisions. Um, I was, I was thinking aardvark, but you know, aardvark. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, whatever. I mean, race car is fine too, I guess. So I, I think we're in a good spot to wrap up. And I, you know, I, I think, I think there's, there's a lot of room to grow and come up with creative solutions, even inside constraints. Uh, I think it's just heavily dependent. If you're in a collaborative, uh, you know, effort, if it's a collaborative effort, you know, focusing on honesty and good communication and getting everyone on the same page so you're all creating the same creative work, uh, it's it's imperative. And I, I think if there's, there's any questions, they should be answered early. Um, and this is idealistic, but you should have enough time to audition creative things before they're baked in. Um, cause once you're baked in, it's, it's always hard to walk things back, especially when you have to answer to people. Um, so, you know, I just want to say thanks for joining me today, Colin. I, I think we covered some great stuff and I think we stayed on track for the most part. Um, can you tell people how they can find you? Well, I'm a bit of a hermit, but uh, you can find my website at colinthays.com when it's back, and uh, you can find me on IMDb at Colin Thays. Right, and your website uh, redirects to your director's reel right now, right? Yeah, that's just because I haven't had time to make a new website. No, that's fine. It's a good... CMS died. Sad It's a good reel. Um, Yeah, I know the the struggles of that. Um, But... uh, yeah, no, I appreciate you you hopping on, and I just want to say thanks to everyone for tuning in. Uh, if you're tuning in from Spotify, please, if you found value in this, um, you know, Colin's a, a very smart nerd, and so listen to his words. I'm a semi-smart nerd, so listen to my words. But um, uh, if you found value in this, if you can leave a review, uh, follow along, um, and there, leave the voice messages for me on Spotify. I don't know how to do it. I still need to figure it out. If one of you guys can figure it out for me and let me know and then just leave me a message. Um, let me know how, how we did on this podcast. Uh, this is the, the second real episode. So, you know, if you could think of anything to improve, um, you know, let me know. And uh, check us out on YouTube. And we're on Apple Podcasts. We're on iHeartRadio, like all the good stuff. Uh and then one last thing, since I'm just getting started up, uh, follow along on Instagram, but also any shares of the the content for this podcast would be amazing um, and greatly appreciated. Share it with your spouse, your friends, your mother. She probably doesn't know what you do still, um, but yeah, that would be amazing. So I'll leave some links in the show notes and I'll leave you with an acronym that's my version is ABC. Always be creating. Thank you, Alec Baldwin. <laughs> I f- <laughs> that up. Oh, I'm going to leave that acronym thing out. All right. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. I'm stumbling over my words. So you should make a, are- like a feedback email because then you don't have to limit it to Spotify. You're so smart. I listen to podcasts. <laughs> yeah, well, I do have a I'll, link is in the show notes. I'll put the the Driven to Create podcast at Gmail in the show notes. 
Um, but yeah, I appreciate everyone for signing on, signing on, and I think we're good. 